Before you go, you know there's been enormous speculation about your political future. Uh, will you serve your full six-year term as U.S. Senator from Illinois? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, a little. Some of this hype's been a little overblown. It, it's flattering, but I have to remind people that uh, I haven't been sworn in yet. Uh, I don't know where the restrooms are in the Senate. Uh, I'm going to have to figure out how to work the phones, answer constituent mail. Uh, I expect to be in the Senate for quite some time, and hopefully, I'll build up my seniority from uh, my current position, which I believe is 99th out of 100. That was a more innocent time, back when we thought one thing that both parties believed in was American democracy, and it was back when we thought Tim Russert would be hosting Meet the Press forever. My favorite Tim Russert story is also my favorite Daniel Patrick Moynihan story. Pat Moynihan won his Senate seat in 1976 while he was still a tenured professor at Harvard University. He filled up his first year staff in Washington with some of his star students at Harvard. Tim Russert was a lower ranking member of the staff at the beginning, having volunteered for the Moynihan New York Senate campaign and the Buffalo campaign office. Senator Moynihan spotted Tim Russert's political talent early and promoted him up through the ranks to the top job in the Moynihan office. One day, Tim Russert confided in Senator, Senator Moynihan that he felt a little intimidated sometimes by the Harvard boys he was surrounded by on the staff, to which Senator Moynihan said, let me tell you something. What they know, you can learn. But what you know, they will never learn. When I joined Senator Moynihan's staff many years later, the awe for Tim Russert still filled that office. But it was shared by that time by a national audience watching Tim Russert becoming the longest serving host of Meet the Press in history. And by far the wisest person I ever heard discussing politics on television. Now, can you put this cup over your head? No. Why? Because I haven't won it. That's right. Only those who win the cup can put it over their head, but you can, sir, give it a hug. Thank you, my assistant, Mr. Luke Russert. Luke Orth Russert, the only child of Tim Russert and the brilliant journalist Maureen Orth, got his start in TV news at a much younger age than his father did. By age 24, Luke Russert was working the halls of Congress for NBC News. I know within a week at the Capitol that it's my home. It's the best gig in Washington, Luke writes in his new book. When I watched Luke Russert's first television reports from the Capitol, I was worried for him. It took me years of experience working in the Senate to be able to discuss the workings of Congress on television. I didn't see how Luke could pull it off. But his first TV reports were as good as any others that I was seeing on television, and then something inexplicable happened. Within a few months, Luke Russert was delivering what were, for me, the very best reports from Capitol Hill available on television. And one day in the hallway here at NBC, I found myself telling Tom Brokaw, a dear friend of Tim Russert's, that whenever Luke comes on, I turn up the volume on the TV because I'll always learn something. And I just couldn't understand how Luke was able to do that two years after his father died and wasn't there to teach him everything he knew about Capitol Hill. And no one and the Washington Press Corps knew more about Capitol Hill than Tim Russer. With the publication of his new book, Look For Me There, Grieving My Father, Finding Myself, Luke Russert has left me in awe once again, this time, for his work as a writer. There is no new book I can recommend more strongly for the writing itself than Luke Russert's first book, which I hope is the first of many. You don't have to have any idea who Tim Russert is and, or what Luke Russert did for a living to enjoy this book. It is an adventure story of travel around the world by a truly talented travel writer. And like all great travel writing, the author and reader are in search of something beyond what the eye can see and the ear can hear in the most exotic places in the world. The adventure begins in the capital where, like his father before him, Luke Russert, got some course-correcting guidance from a politician who had seen it all. As the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, passed him in the hallway one day, the Speaker gave Luke Russert an order. Come by my office in an hour. When it was just the two of them in the Speaker's office, John Boehner said to Luke, what are you doing on Capitol Hill? You've been here a while now, huh? 
I know Boehner was educated by the Jesuits, and this almost seems like a Jesuit mind game. Who are we and why are we here? Still, I play along. Yes, I've been here about six years now. How old are you? I'm going to turn 30 come summer. 30 is an age that stalked me. It scares me to acknowledge it. Junior, it's time for you to go do something, build something. You don't want to be a lifer here, trust me. I've been here over 20 years. I learned that Boehner worries about my long-term well-being, worries that I've given my life to an institution where time is a flat circle, where it's entirely too possible to wake up 15 years down the line and not know what happened to yourself or the outside world. If you knew people only through politics, then you didn't really know people. As I walk out, I'm not angry at him. There's no rush of, don't tell me what to do, old man. Instead, it takes me a while to realize this. In his own unintentional way, Boehner channels the spirit of my father. He pushes me to think. One night, I take out a notepad and list the reasons for staying at NBC in Washington. After an hour, the nays beat out the yays. And joining us now is author Luke Russert, the new book, is Look For Me There, Grieving My Father, Finding Myself, which is out today. Uh, Luke, thank you <laughs> very much for being goodness. here. Uh, thank you. That's the best introduction I've ever had so, in my entire life. <laughs> so I, I was sad when you left this job here. Yeah. With this book in my hands, less than halfway through, I would be so sad today for who you would be if you had stayed here compared to who you are, who this person is, who I discovered in this book. Uh, that Boehner moment was the very first time that you thought, maybe I have to course correct. It was this catalyst. And there had been things that had been going on in my head. My dad died at 58, so that number was very prevalent. Turning 30, getting closer to there. I lost a young friend at 27, so I was very conscientious of death. But I had these anxieties, and I couldn't answer why am i doing this and i had a heck of a gig lawrence mm -hmm. i mean i would have dinner sometimes next to the director the cia the united states senator the president of the united states knew me my knew my knew me by name i was living a life that people dreamed of would do anything for but i felt off and when boehner said that to me somebody who was at the highest high who was arguably the most important person on capitol hill and one of the most important people in washington Go, check so, go do something else, go check off some more boxes because one, this will always be here, but you don't wanna end up here when you're 50, 60, 70 because you will have let all that time slip away. And I took his advice and, and I got out of there. I didn't know how long it was gonna be. I thought maybe six months to a year, it ended up being three years, but I'm a much better person for it. The, um, I identify with this book so completely. Uh, my 20s, if I had a resume, the 20s would be this big blank space that looks like prison time because I was trying to do a version of this. I'd, be, I'd work in a parking lot for a while and then I'd go to South America for a while and then I'd come back and work in the parking lot again and go to Europe. Uh, I was trying to do it uh, not in such a, a careful way. I didn't rack up the countries you racked up, which I'm... I'm just in awe. You've taken Still me... time. I know. Well, well that's what everyone says. Uh, but um, so... When you were out there, uh, we, I, we do encounter in the book the young people your age and younger who you're meeting out there who are doing versions of this. It was eye-opening to me because I was a little bit older for the Bohemian Backpackers set, mm -hmm. uh, 30, 31, 32. But I would come across people, including one named Maggie in New Zealand, who was in her early 20s, worked as part of a music trade union in France, would assume a, a, a get enough hours in the year to be able to get paid out and then go travel for the rest of the year. So eight months of work, four months of travel. And I asked her, I said, well, how are you, we're in New Zealand. How are you getting around? She says, I follow the potato harvest to make money to go around the country. And then when I need a ride, I just go like this. Mm -hmm. So what is this? She goes, I hitchhike. It's safe here for, for a young person and woman to do. It's a very civilized, beautiful country. I was floored. I was floored. I go, oh my goodness, what have, what have I been doing here? I'm this, thinking I'm this big, strong, burly guy with this great pedigree, et cetera. And this young woman was 10 times tougher than I mm -hmm. was, both mentally and physically. And I learned that from her. Another guy on that trip, a guy named Felix, young surfer. 
I pick him up hitchhiking. First time I had ever done that. First time I ever picked up. First time I ever picked up the hitchhiker, and we're talking, and he's got this tattoo, and he starts sort of getting teary-eyed about a love that he had lost that he had just hitchhiked to drop off at the airport, and he's talking about this pure love, and I think about my own life. I go, I never had that type of a pure love with a relationship. One of the first things I would always think about was, could this woman work in official Washington? Would it be okay? How would it look? What is that? Right? I mean, what is wrong with you? And those two things back to back from two young kids in their 20s were so eye opening and realized that I lived in such a bubble, number one, and I was not nearly as strong as I thought I was.